What do you do if you have an old, burned-out row crop field and you want to graze cows on it? We're going to find out today in this episode of Grass-Fed Life, coming up. Welcome to Grass-Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego. D-I-E-G-O. Here at Grass-Fed Life, we have one goal, to help you increase profitability on pasture. From free resources like blog posts and this podcast to our online courses, we want to help you operate your livestock farm more profitably. As we near the end of 2018, and you're talking to your CPA and you're in need of a tax write-off, think about looking at one of the online courses that we offer at grassfedlife.co. One of those courses might be a great way to get a late-in-the-year write-off for your farm-based business and help you learn something in the process so you can ultimately get more value out of that course than you put into it. At this time of the year, this can be a win-win depending on your accounting circumstances. Write off, knowledge, and profitability down the line. Talk to your CPA, think about it, and check out the online courses at grassfedlife.co. In today's episode, Darby and I are going to be talking about converting a row crop field over to a perennial pasture. If this topic sounds familiar, then don't be surprised. It should, because earlier this year, we put out an episode that's essentially part one of this series on converting a row crop field to a pasture. In that episode, which aired earlier in the year, Darby talked about why he was doing this conversion and the basic steps he had done up to that point. Today, we're going to follow up on that previous episode and bring you up to speed in terms of where things are at right now with that conversion. Let's jump right into it. Converting a row crop field to pasture. Part two, the results. Uh, A little over a year ago, um, back in the fall of 2017, uh, we made the decision to go ahead and start renovating another uh, conventional row crop field on our farm. We we took that property back from the tenant farmer and, you know, put together, implemented a plan to, you know, put up fence around it. So I, I actually... For the first time, I went out and got an equipment loan uh, to to build some fence because there was a lot of fence to put up here. It's about uh, 4,600 linear feet. Um, hired a contractor to do it. I didn't have time. I was too worn out into the year to build fence. Uh, we had to actually build a bridge to uh, get over a uh, we'll call it a little branch creek, but it can get very very full. Um, and planted some uh, some cereal rye late last fall. Once the uh, the soybeans were out, uh, t- you know, to to grow this winter and spring, so the cows would have something to to graze early this year. Uh, we wanted to you know get them out there so that we could get their manure and urine on the ground and 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 start the renovation process of the soil um, before we, you know, did anything else, uh, you know, going into the the spring. And, um, we had to ramp up beef production to pay for all this. Like we had to cash flow all of it. We had to be able to make the loan payment. Uh, and that's, that's coming up here in the next few weeks. We've got to make that first loan payment. Uh, we had to, you know, buy seed and rent a drill to put it in. Actually had to rent the drill twice. Um, we had to, you know, contract one of our neighbors to disc up the uh, cereal rye once it was done so we could plant the next crop, which we'll we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, we had to cash flow the lease payment. You know, we don't get the property for free. We have to lease the ground back from my family. So we had to make sure that we had cows lined up that we uh, could sell into the bulk program. Uh, you know, we had to make sure we'd have enough grazing for everybody and we could cash flow this whole thing. And it was a pretty big undertaking for us. So when we last did an episode on this, it was six months ago, it was April earlier this year. You had planted cereal rye. It was a few inches tall. Looking back, how did that cereal rye work out for you? I wouldn't call the cereal rye an epic fail, but it it wasn't great. Uh, And it wasn't, it wasn't the cereal rye's fault. Um, we actually got a really good stand of cereal rye 
Um, it installed easily. It germinated. It came up. We had one of those springs where we didn't really have spring. Um, we basically went from winter to summer. So the cereal rye, typically it wants to start growing when your soil temperatures, you know, start getting up to, you know, 50, 60, 65 degrees. And then it will really take off and, and, and basically start growing like, you know, two, three, four inches a day. Well, normally, you know, we, we would expect to start seeing that happen here um, maybe as like early as the middle of March, but definitely by the end of March, beginning of April, we'd start to see that. Well, we didn't get those temperatures here until the end of April. Uh, normally we'd be grazing grass by the end of April. We couldn't start grazing our grass until sometime in May. And then about the time the cereal or I took off, we just totally skipped spring, went straight into summer, had 90 degree days and the cereal or I said, Oh, I'm done. And kind of quit. Um, we had we had planned on having 30 grazing days. Uh, we figured if it went bad, we'd get 20 to 22 grazing days. We thought if it went good, we'd get 40 grazing days. I think we got 10. So the cereal rye fortunately didn't cost a whole lot of money. Um, it didn't really gain us a whole lot or not, definitely didn't gain us as much as we would have liked. Given that you couldn't get as much grazing out of it. How do you view it from a pasture evolution standpoint? Do you still still think enough of a role was played there by the cereal rye to help things along? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because we did get a lot of biomass out there. Uh, we we did get, you know, whatever it was, you know, three three dozen to forty two cows. I forget exactly uh, out there for about ten days, and then actually we were, we were able to keep. Um, a handful of them out there an extra like five days or so. Um, we just, we would have liked to have had more activity out there from the cows, more urine, more manure, a little bit more biomass from the cereal rye would have been good. Um, it would have saved us, you know, feeding hay, which really that was one of the main goals uh, on, on top of everything else was to cut down how much hay we would have to feed. We ended up having to buy a little bit of additional hay, to kind of get us through that that really, you know, cold snap uh, till the pastures took off, but it, it definitely helped because we did get some roots out there uh, down into the ground, you know, four, six, eight inches. Uh, the plants did get up about knee high, and and the animals were out there, so it got things kickstarted in the right direction. Um, now because of the cold spring. We, we 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 had to alter our plans. Our our hope was to install the cereal rye, let the cows graze it, get um, uh, the rest of the pastures kind of really not too mature, but but pretty mature, and then you know pull the cows off the cereal rye. We applied for an NRCS grant to to put that into you know perennial grasses. And, and legumes. Um, our hope was we'd have that. We could go out, install it, give it about 60 days to germinate and take off, lightly graze it, and then come back on to the other perennials we have and just kind of, you know, ease those perennials along. Uh, two things happened. Uh, we didn't get enough grazing out of the cereal rye because of the cold weather. We didn't end up getting the NRCS grant. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the rest of the, the pastures were behind because of how cold it was. So we, we had to go an alternate route and use an annual, uh, which I've never done before, uh, out on this ground so that we had, we had plenty of grazing for these cows. Cause remember we brought in all these, you know, extra yearling uh, stalkers, uh, you know, to, to finish. Um, and we actually started bringing them in about a year ago. Uh, last October, uh, thinking we'd have, we'd have all this extra grazing, which was a little bit of the roll of the dice. So we had to put a quick growing annual out there, which ended up being more expensive than we had planned for. Um, you know, that that ended up costing us a couple thousand dollars and there was no no grant money to help offset that. So, you know, that kind of came out of our pocket. Um, but, you know, that overall worked 
worked pretty well. Uh, it didn't, it didn't work great, but it worked pretty well. Um, and that, again, that added a ton of biomass out there and lots and lots of cattle activity. We had 50 head of cattle out on that, uh, that annual, uh, for, for quite a while. And, um, the, the cows gained really, really well on it. So, you know, in the end, I, I'd, I'd call that, I'd call it a win. It wasn't as big of a win as I had hoped, but it was a win. You have these freaky weather events in Indiana there. Springs are all over the board in recent years. Looking back and knowing that, is there a better gap filler than the cereal rye? You know, there's a possibility knowing what I know now. Maybe I wouldn't have planted the cereal rye. Maybe I would have planted a what's called a forage oat this spring. Um, that's actually something I'm going to consider going into next spring over there. I don't know that I want to plant the cereal rye again this fall, uh, which we've got the option to do because it's still an annual. Um, I think the oats probably would have done a little bit better than the rye. Uh, j- just based on the conditions and and what what little bit I know about them, just from talking from you know with some other guys that uh, that have had have had those in the past, um, I, I guess there was more upside with the cereal rye because it once it gets established, you graze it and you keep grazing it and you keep grazing it until you terminate it. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. The oats, like once they get grazed, they're done. Uh, they're a safer bet in terms of germination and growth, but there's nowhere near as much upside. And we, you know, we kind of went for the upside. From what little you know, what are the differences between the cereal rye and the oats? The oats will definitely grow better with lower temperatures, um, particularly this one variety of, of fridge oat that our seed supplier has. Um, like, you know, if it's wet and cloudy and 40 degrees, 45 degrees, like it's going to, you know, it's going to, try and take off. Uh, whereas that cereal rye, like it's really going to sit there until you get some warm sunny days that the soil temperatures just have to be higher for it to, to do its thing. Um, you know, and that's just, it's just one of those things. Like if we wouldn't had this wonky spring, I'd probably be telling everybody in the world how great cereal rye is and that you should plant it and it can't fail. <laughs> right. But, you know, there, therein lies the trick with farming. Like, you know, what works one time isn't going to work the next time and, and vice versa. Um, but the, the, like I said, the oats, not as much forage, but more of a guarantee that they're going to grow and produce. The installation cost would have been roughly the same for, for either one of those crops. So uh, cost being the same, like I said, I, I went for the upside on the cereal rye. Um, we've just... You know, you just don't really plan on going from winter to summer in in three weeks. And that was what we had happen here. When you have a bridge crop that is getting you from, say, point A to your final perennial forage, or say it's a, you know, graze it once and it's done in the case of the oats, do you manage your grazing differently? Like just say, oh, ladies have at it, take her to the ground. Or do you want to leave some stubble out there knowing that you'll either no-till into it or maybe a disc it? What are your thoughts there? It really depends on, on what you've planted out there. Now, like with the oats, uh, we, we would have broken that up into paddocks. We would have basically just given them a day's worth of food at a time. Uh, you don't want them going willy-nilly over the whole 15 acres because any anything they step on, they're going to – particularly that time of year, trample it down into the mud. They're not going to eat it. Sure, it's biomass, and that that's good. Again, I mean, really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is, you know, a renovation project, you know, converting a row crop field into a perennial pasture. So the biomass is good, but that doesn't help your short term. I've got to fatten up these extra cows I brought in and have sold to finish in October so I can, I can cash flow all the costs on this crazy thing. Um, so with, again, with oats, we would have broken that up into paddocks and given them, you know, a day's worth of food at a time with the cereal rye as, and I, like I, one of my good friends has planted, I have watched that stuff in action and I have watched it 
you know, the year he planted his, he waited too long to put his cows on it. And that stuff was growing 12 inches a day. It was insane. His cows couldn't keep up with it. Um, so, you know, once we put the cows on the ride, like I just let them have at it. We put them all out there and gave them the whole 15 acres and said, go nuts. And uh, it it just, you know, the conditions weren't right for it to, to grow as as aggressively uh, as as we thought it would. Now, this summer, once we went back with that summer annual, and, and what we used was a sorghum Sudan grass, which is a very aggressive annual, but it's it's more like the uh, the cereal rye in that once you graze it, it's going to come back. What we did there was we we took this 15 acres and we broke it up into five large paddocks and we'd put the whole herd into a paddock for two to three days. Um, you're you're kind of watching this like a grass a little bit, like you don't want to overgraze it completely. You can you can overgraze it more uh, than perennial grasses because it does come back so aggressively, um, but you still got to rotate them off of it so that it, it will come back. And that strategy works pretty well. We definitely learned some lessons uh, having never grazed that before. I, I definitely waited too long to put them on it. It got pretty tall. Uh, it was, gosh, chest high. I mean, and it, it went from ankle high to knee high in about six days, and it went from knee high to chest high in about five days. I mean, that stuff, once it took off, it really took off. We just had optimal conditions for it. We started getting 90 to 95 degree days with high humidity and lots of rain. And that stuff just took off like we had poured rocket fuel on it. Um, and when we put the cows in there for the first time, they, they trampled so much of it because they were, they were just knocking it over. It wasn't down where they could graze it, it was head high and they were just knocking it down. So we didn't get as much grazing out of it the first time around as I would have liked. Uh, we got about half as much as I had anticipated, which, you know, again, didn't really meet our expectations, but it did come back very well. And uh, the cows fattened up on it remarkably well. Now, we we did have to set out some hay out here. For anybody that's listening to this, you can't just take cows from grass and throw them out onto a high octane fuel like sorghum Sudan grass and not give them some roughage. You've got to let them, you know, balance out their rumen. So we actually did feed, you know, one at a time. Uh, we, we'd put out a, a full round bale of, of dry grass hay so that the cows could, you know, uh, go to that if they, they, they needed it. Um, and that really helped them acclimate to this, this really well, um, they looked phenomenal on it. The the weight gains, I, I wish I had a scale here. I don't. So I could tell you, well, we gained X pounds per day on all these stockers. I, I can't tell you exactly what it was. All I can tell you is that they got really fat and very well muscled and very well marbled. And, you know, we're, we're recording this now in the end of October and we're starting to see some of that beef come back and it's, it's got just amazing marbling in it. I honestly can't wait to taste some of it and and see what it tastes like uh with with all that extra marbling so again while we didn't get as much grazing out of the sorghum sudan as we would have liked it did its job it put a ton of biomass out there uh once we get that you know mowed down and let it decompose i'll be doing another soil test because for me i really want to see like what have we done in 12 months for the soil organic matter, you know, what do all these minerals look like? Like how, how, how fast have we repaired this soil? Because the whole reason we're doing this for, for people that don't know, they haven't listened to some of the older episodes of the podcast. The last time I took over a, a conventional row crop field from my family, I had an NRCS grant. I just went out and planted it into perennials right from the get go. And it germinated and it grew and it's usable, but it didn't take off as well as it should have. And that was me being really hard headed and saying, nope, I'm going to do it this way. And it's going to be, you know, strictly uh, an organic, uh, you know, way that we're going to install this and we're not going to help it along. We're, we're not going to, you know, do any of these bridge crops and it, 
it was it was just it was stupid. It was just a bad way to do it. And again, that pasture is is good and it's getting better. We've we've more than doubled our carrying capacity on it capacity on it since we started it. But we could have done that a whole lot faster if we would have done some annuals, put some cows on it, and got the the, the soil microbes actually out there instead of just planting into this burned out soybean field that maybe had 1% organic matter uh, to begin with, you know, because that, that grass plant, that perennial, that perennial plant, like it needs, it, it needs a good bed to be planted into just like a vegetable crop does. Thinking of the sorghum Sudan and not getting enough out of it, grazing wise, if you had started grazing it when it was shorter, do you think that would have changed things around? Oh yeah, yeah. I I think, I think uh, our our goal was to get about sixty grazing days out of that sorghum Sudan. I'd have to go back and look exactly. We, we got somewhere around like thirty two to thirty five days. I think if I would have put them on there about five days sooner than I did, I, I think we would have easily gone from thirty five up to forty five days, may, maybe even fifty days. Um, I think we could have grazed it once more um uh than we did we got that installed a little bit late i mean everything was late because of this wonky spring we had you know uh, i think i planted them like june 9th uh really should have been planting that gosh may 15th may 22nd somewhere in there it was warm enough at that point um and then if i would have grazed it a little bit differently like i think it's totally possible with four dozen head of cattle ranging from 500 pounds to 1200 pounds on 15 acres to get 60 plus grazing days and as hard as it was this fall we could have got more if i if i would have managed it a little bit differently and that's just part of the learning curve you know i've never done it before i've never planted sorghum sudan i've never grazed sorghum sudan um so it's just you know uh <laughs> you know good decisions come from experience and uh experience comes from bad decisions you know and i made a couple bad decisions and gained the experience and moving forward we'll get a whole lot more mileage out of an annual seeing the results now with sorghum sudan would that be a go-to for a summer annual i mean dare i say committing to something with the freaky weather but did you like it enough that that would be a primary choice if you had a similar situation and you had to seed something again, or would you go back and say, eh, is there something better? It's pretty daggone good. You know, if you've got the right conditions and you can drill it into the ground and you know, you're going to get the moisture on it uh, for it to take off and grow. It's hard to beat. Um, I think, you know, if I were to do an annual again next summer, I would probably talk with some more people and, Sorghum Sudan would be probably a portion of the solution. It might be 50% of the mix. I think I would put some other stuff in there with it. Uh, just so you've got some diversity. So like if the weather conditions don't play nice or maybe you don't get to graze it as soon as you need to, or maybe you graze it a little too soon, like you're, you're just going to have more diversity out there. Um, and I don't know what that diversity would be exactly, but – I, I think sorghum Sudan in a mix in the next year w would be a good choice. It is so, – sorghum Sudan is like the – it's got the biggest upside of any annual you can plant. Cows absolutely love it. It is like crack for cows. They go bonkers on it. They gain weight like crazy on it. Um, but you're putting all your eggs into one basket. Like if you plant it and you don't get the moisture and it doesn't take off or whatever, like, and it's expensive. It's one of the most expensive annuals I can choose to plant. Um, but man, if, if the conditions are right and you get it established, there's nothing like it. So I guess thinking again, that this is a potential bridge crop and tying back into something that I asked about earlier, if you know perennials are coming after it, whether you divide it into paddocks or not, do you care if the cattle literally graze it to the ground? Meaning you manage it differently than you would on a pasture you want to keep. If you know it's gone, do you, I mean, one thought I have, and this may or may not be accurate, is 
to let them take it to the ground. Get as much of that biomass into their rumen as you can because we're just going to end up tilling it in or it's going to winter kill or we're just going to no-till our perennial next to it. And then we'll move them to the next paddock where you would never do that in a pasture you want to keep because the grass wouldn't recover. Where in this case, who cares? The goal isn't for it to recover. Yeah, I mean, it's, in this case, I mean, we kind of split the difference there between grazing it to the ground and and treating it like grass because we we know it's going to come back and we want it to come back well. Um, so you don't let them trample every every last little bit of it into the ground, but you you know you do run it pretty hard. Um, it, it it's amazing how fast it recovers, even if you do let the cows overdo it and quote unquote damage it, uh, stuff still comes back. You know, it wants to survive. Now that last pass, when we had them out there and we knew we weren't going to go back to it. Like we left them out there a couple extra days, took all the lines down, uh, and just let them have the whole thing and just let them walk around and pick at it and pick at it and pick at it until they finally started bawling at us. Like, Hey, we're hungry. We need to move on. And then we, we, we put them back onto the grasses to, uh, to finish them. Um, so when you know it's the end, absolutely. Just let them, you know, try, try, let them try and kill it. Same with the, the, uh, you know, the, the cereal rye. When it's that last pass, you know, let them have at it and, uh, eat as much of it as they can, gain as much weight as they can and trample as much of that biomass into the ground as they possibly can. Because again, we're, we're basically we're trying to fatten cattle, cash flow the whole operation, but really what we're trying to do is to prep the seed bed for these perennials that we're we're going to ins- install at some point in the future. Which brings us to that some point in the future, given where you're at, given how everything's played out, you've applied for a grant. When do the perennials go in and how are they fitting into the plan now? And then maybe how has that changed given how things like the grant and such have played out? Well, we still haven't heard back on the grant, so you know it's possible we we may not get one. I don't know. Um, so we you know we may have to uh, decide like, hey, we're just going to pay for this out of our own pocket. Um, we actually applied for three things on this grant. Uh, we applied for internal fence. Um, which is pretty straightforward and pretty easy and not, not that expensive. Uh, you know, when we start talking about dollars, uh, we applied for uh, a perennial grass mix to put out there, which again, there's some costs there, but it's not really expensive. The big thing we applied for was some buried water, which that's like double the other two things combined almost, um, to, to put that buried water in that buried water, like, we can we can put a temporary water solution out there for a long time and make it work and we can we can bide our time on it until that grant comes through um uh, but on you know on the internal fence like i i can tell you that's going to get installed grant or no grant going into next year uh one thing we learned with with the cows when you get the sorghum sudan tall enough that the little guys can't see over it, they start wigging out. And we what we did is we, we put in T-posts two feet into the ground. We used a bunch of portable reels. We got them all hot. I mean, we had four to five kilovolts on all these things. But once that grass got up to where they couldn't see that line and it got over their eyes, it was a real problem. We, we had we had cows in the wrong areas a lot. Uh, hindsight being 2020. I should have taken our side by side and driven and knocked over the sorghum Sudan uh, up against the the line before I turned the cows into that paddock. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to quote unquote waste the forage. Um, but we we had a lot of headaches because we didn't have that internal fence out there and we couldn't like rotate them with normal means. Uh, so that that's going in for sure. I think next spring. At a bare minimum, I'll probably do a forage out. I think I'd, you know, we'll see what the soil test tells us here in a, in a month or two. I think I'm going to want to get some more activity out there uh, before we do that perennial. We'll have time to do that. We'll have time to put a forage out, out there, graze it, and then still, if we choose to go ahead with that perennial, we'll have time to do that as well. 
uh, assuming we have a semi-normal spring. And that might buy us some time to, to see if that, that pasture planting grant comes through. If it doesn't, then, you know, we'll be at another crossroad. Like, well, do we want to go ahead and do more annuals and get better gains? Because, I mean, cows absolutely gain better on annuals. There's just more energy in them. Um, part of that question is going to get answered when we sit down this winter and look at, okay, here are our sales projections. Here's how many stockers we have. These are the sizes they are. These are how many stockers we've committed to buy from our other two sources that we get grass-fed stockers from. Here's our overall, you know, 10,000-foot uh, view in our grazing plan for 2019. Here's what finances look like. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into that decision-making. So I say all that to say beyond planting oats next spring and building some internal fence, I don't know what we're going to do. Removing the finances side of things, what are you looking for when you decide to go from annual to perennial, just say from a pasture standpoint? Is there anything there, whether that's a soil test, whether that's a look, that says, hey, this pasture is ready? So you don't avoid that problem that you had when you did that upper paddock that was slower growing. Yeah, from a from a soil test standpoint, I want to see better numbers um, when we go out there to to plant that perennial seed mix. Um, just knowing that it's got there's some biology actually happening in the soil because in a in a burned out row crop field there is no soil biology. Uh, that back pasture when I started with that, I mean it was, you know, it was so hard. I mean you could have darn near played tennis on it. It had 1% organic matter. There was no nutrients in the soil. The nitrogen was okay, not great, because it had had soybeans on it. So you do get a little bit of a nitrogen credit there. Um, but the grass just struggled. And really what, I, what I'm hoping to see from this when we go do that soil test. Now, our first soil test, we actually had better soil organic matter uh, on on. On this conversion, probably because it's, it's what we would call bottom ground, it's down low, the other area is up high, it's typically you've got more fertile soil, so we, we had a little bit better organic matter. But I, what I'm hoping to see is when we when we go to plant that, I, I hope that soil organic matter is like, you know, 3% and that we've got a decent amount of trace minerals in it. Um, and, you know, something else I'll do is to uh, apply some uh, organic fertilizer to it. Uh, there's a product we use that it helps your germination rate. Um, that's something I didn't didn't do the last time. Of course, I didn't didn't have my my little uh, 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 you know liquid sprayer built that that we have now. Um, but we just want to give that that perennial seed every opportunity we can to establish faster and thicker and have it be more healthy so that we can get the animals out there sooner. Now, we're not going to graze it the same way we're going to graze an established pasture. Uh, but we definitely, you know, we don't want to have to wait for a year. It'd be nice to have a year, uh, but it also, uh, you know, you, you've got the reality of, well, if I don't put annuals out, I'm still so going these cows. I got to feed. So, you know, you know how do, how do we go about that? And again, it's it's really going to depend on what we sit down and decide this winter. But you know what? We we may do those oats. We may do another annual next summer and graze it. And kind of the safer bet with those grasses um, is to then go and do a fall planting. You know, so we'd go out about mid September. And, you know, mow down whatever's out there, disc it in, break it up, and then get out there and install those perennial grasses in September so that they take off and grow, get established. And then we're going to make that the last stop in that first rotation in the following spring. So it, it might be June 1st before we get around to grazing that the following year, now talking about 2020. You know, so maybe those grasses will have a, a nine-month window to really get established. We're going to graze it light. 
then go back to the the older, more established pastures. Maybe we have to push them a little bit, graze them a little bit harder than we'd like to to give that that new area time to recover. But I think a fall planting, you know, the the more I get into this, uh, the more I like that idea. And if I if I would have gotten that that grant this year, you know, water line and internal fence be damned, I, I would have gotten the cows out of there whenever I had to by September 15th, bush hogged everything down, dissed it up, and um, if the if the soil numbers looked good and, and planted that real grass mix so that we'd have that out of the way and it'd be ready to rock uh, in 2019. At this point, do you feel like you have a recipe? Not necessarily in terms of what crops you're planting, but maybe a process I mean, that's a better way of asking it versus a recipe. Is there a general base principles approach here that somebody in Massachusetts or Connecticut or West Virginia or Missouri could start to apply based on your experience? I mean, from what I'm hearing is you start the row crop field, you give it a little bit of juice via some sort of fertilizer to get it started, get some biology out there, graze it, and then just succession on that grazing, adding fertilizer as needed to keep helping it along? You know, the the ground is, it's so devoid of anything. And whether you want to use a conventional fertilizer or an organic fertilizer, and look, I, I'm not a conventional guy. Um, but I think, well, we're talking about converting burned out row crop field. I don't care if you're planting perennials or annuals or whatever, like you're going to have to use something. That That's my experience. And organic fertilizers are okay. Um, you know, one, one of our main goals this, this past spring was we were going to apply chicken manure out there and then use a top dress organic fertilizer in liquid form to, you know, nurse the crop along. That was plan. And then spring happened and punched us in the nose and we couldn't get the, uh, the, the, the chicken manure, which would have been conventional. Uh, but I don't care because it's still organic in nature. We, we couldn't get it out there. Um, it was just the, the ground was a mess and we couldn't get it out there. And the other thing I learned was, you know, I, I, I'd called last fall, got some numbers together on chicken manure, talked with guys about it, talked with people who had spread it. When the ground finally did get to a point this spring, that we could think about applying that. Um, lo and behold, I couldn't get them to come out and do 15 acres. Uh, their minimum requirement was, you know, like 50 to 100 acres was what they wanted to apply chicken manure on. So, you know, for a small project like that, and that they didn't want to do it. And like, I get it, I understand. And that wasn't a question I thought to ask. So part of my strategy kind of went out the window from the get-go we had this window to get this sorghum Sudan in. And for the first time in my life, I begrudgingly, uh, you know, bit the bullet, so to speak. And I, I used a, a conventional nitrogen fertilizer to get that sorghum Sudan established. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't like doing it. Um, I don't think I'll do it again. But, you know, it was it was something we had to do. The cows were here. We were committed. Uh, we couldn't get the chicken manure out there. So, you know, it was a one shot deal to, uh, to get that sorghum Sudan established. It worked, it worked wonderfully. I, from a results standpoint, I understand why farmers use conventional fertilizer because it, it does work. It does make stuff grow. Um, you know, I, I, I don't ever want to have to do that again. I'll, I'll plan better in the future. Um, but just know, like, you're going to have to do something. If that's conventional fertilizer, if it's chicken manure, if it's if it's a lot of organic fertilizer, whatever. Uh, you know, something you could do, uh, and we, you know, hindsight being 2020, you know, knowing what I know now about the uh, uh, about that cereal rye, if I would have known that was going to be an epic fail, um, I would have made the fence cow proof completely. We didn't hang the gates and stuff till the spring. I would have put all that stuff up last fall. I would have done all my, my hay grazing out there. 
You know, we elected not to do that. We didn't get the gates put up. We didn't we didn't have the bridge 100 percent complete. We didn't have it electrified. We planted that that uh, cereal rye. We can let the cows go to a bit. You know, uh, knowing what I know now, if I could button all the the up, I would have done all my my bale grazing out there. That would have added at least some level of manure and urine and biomass last fall from that from the hay feeding to to stimulate that. We might have gotten away without using that conventional fertilizer this spring if we had done that. I don't know. Uh, we could have unrolled bales if we wanted to to really spread stuff out. Um, there's a number of different tactics you can employ. This is definitely one of those things where what works for you probably isn't going to work for somebody else. And I think you got to be very careful about being critical of someone's tactics when it comes to trying to convert dead ground into living ground that will in time become functionally organic. Criticism is one thing that we've seen people email in in the past where it's don't seed, you know, that costs money. So let's start looking at the economics of this because one approach and it's the slow approach is you do nothing and it, whatever shows up, shows up. And you've talked a lot in the past about why you haven't gone that route. But for somebody looking to do this on 16 acres, what are your actual numbers looking like? Well, so we'll, we'll start with the, um, the, the really easy numbers that, that go back to last fall. So we, we borrowed about $10,000 to, to get this thing started. And $7,500 of that went into fence and labor uh, gates to, to get the thing built and secured. So that was $7,500. We had about $1,000 for that bridge which I got that done really, really cheaply. Actually, it was a little close to like 900. Um, a couple of years ago, the uh, the county highway department replaced a large 36-inch uh, culvert uh, on our county road. It was all rusted out on the bottom. It was uh, 36 feet long. And I told them like, hey, if you guys don't want to haul that off, just drag it right over here in uh, in the weeds, and I'll take it. And they were happy to leave it. And so I cut that thing in half, and we actually put two 36-inch pipes side by side for our bridge. That saved a lot of money because two two pipes, if I would have gone out and bought those, and I priced them, uh, would have cost me about seven hundred to a thousand bucks. So we got the bridge done for a thousand dollars. That included hiring a guy. Uh, with a backhoe to put those pipes in and and uh, haul some gravel in and stuff, get the bridge put together. Uh, we had about seven hundred bucks in fuel and seed and uh, drill rental to to plant the rye. So that's that. That's kind of how we shot that that ten thousand dollars initially. So that got us set up for this spring, and then uh, once the rye was gone. We had to rent the drill again. We had to buy the sorghum sedan seed, the fertilizer, um, fuel. We paid a neighbor of ours to disc up the uh, the the cereal rye. I disced it once myself. I've got a small disc here that we've we've rebuilt, and did a pretty good job knocking it down once. Uh, but once it came down to plant it, I really wanted to get a, a great seed bed out there and to get that that initial biomass broken up so it break down faster. So we hired him to do that. We had this summer roughly about two thousand bucks that we 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 put into things uh, for for the cows to be able to go out there and graze. So you know, so far it's about about twelve thousand uh, dollars. We've also got the lease on that ground that we're gonna you know be paying back to our family. It's fifteen acres. It's one hundred and thirty dollars an acre. So we've got about another two thousand dollars. I'll be writing that check here in a couple of weeks. So that puts us at fourteen thousand. Um, if I don't get any grants, looking in two thousand nineteen for the internal fence and a couple of eats, that's a thousand bucks. The perennial planting of grasses, uh, and this doesn't include the oats. If we want to go do the forage oats, you'd have to add to this. But that perennial planting is going to twenty five hundred dollars. Um, we'd use some organic fertilizer on that fuel 
on top of that. So that's another 500 bucks. Now you're, you're, you're talking about $4,000. The buried water is the big one. That's at least 5,000 bucks. We've got a, it's, it's 900 feet from where the water is today just to get to the western edge of this new pasture area. And then it's 1,200 feet from west to east. So we're looking at five, $6,000 there. I mean, you know, all in, we're, we're talking about roughly a $25,000 project by the time it's all said and done. And then, oh, by the way, you got to go buy the cows to put out there <laughs> and wait a couple of years for them to get fat enough to sell. Um, and th- this, is, this is one of the reasons I, I, I laugh, like belly laugh hard at people when they call and they want a half of a cow. And I say, I'm, I'm 12 months out. And they say, well, you just need to raise more cows. You know, so that I can call you on a on a dime at half of a 100% grass fed cow, and I'm like, well, you know, give me twenty five thousand dollars in two years, and and I'll be happy to provide you with that half cow. Uh, it takes a lot of time and patience and money to to make this happen. If the grant kicks in, where does that move it from twenty five to where? If I were to get grant money for everything, like that would save me eight to nine thousand dollars. So that's a pretty big chunk. You know, you're talking literally like a third of the project cost goes away. Yeah, and one of the issues with grants is, I mean, you're fronting all of this and then the grant reimburses you if you do get it. So you would have to come up with this money somehow ahead of time. And that's your case, whether or not the grant applies to be determined. For somebody hearing this, they might be getting a little bit of sticker shock. How do you quantify if it's worth it? 16 acres, 25 grand, you're raising cattle on it. Like there's, that's not easy math to try and say, here's my payback period or here's why I can justify this. How would you start to advise somebody to think about this on a dollar spent now versus what I'll get back down the line basis? For us, long term, uh, cattle are going to be the bulk of business. Um, you know, I, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, my body's got a lot of mileage on it. Cattle, once you have the infrastructure in place, cattle are, are pretty easy. Um, there's more demand for 100% grass fed beef than can currently be met. And, you know, for us, it's like it's a long term investment into our future. So once we get through, call it a four year period. That's all going to be free and clear. We will only have maintenance costs on it. So I kind of look at it like, you know, once we leave year four, we go into year five, like we're going to be making really good money on that ground. So it's, you know, it's a long term play. This isn't I'm going to go build a chicken tractor and in nine weeks I'm going to have a saleable product. And, you know, we we we've demonstrated like how you can go make six to $10,000 an acre in, in nine weeks with chickens. You know, this, this is not that. Um, I think you really have to be comfortable with numbers. You've got to be comfortable with your business. You know, uh, you've got to be uh, comfortable with waiting on that long of a return. If you're married, your spouse has to be really comfortable waiting on that long of a return. They've got to be on board. Um, but really, if you think about, let's say easy math is $24,000 over four years. Um, well, let me, let me back that up. You have to edit that out. So really, really easy math. Let's say, you know, with the, all the infrastructure, and if I don't get any grants and the lease every year, the whole kit and caboodle, let, let's just say it's $30,000 over over four years. You know, that's only, it's 7500 bucks a year, which, that's a lot of money. But at the same time, we had the demand from customers to, uh, to, to increase. Uh, we, we've added animals and the animals are literally cash flowing this thing as, as we go. So yes, we're, we're investing time. Yes. We have to manage those animals. Yes. We have to get them fat, get them 
you know, sold and, and, and to the processor get paid. But like we were very comfortable with this because of where our business is, because of the demand for the product. Um, like we're just, we're very comfortable with it. And then once we get, you know, post four years out, we've got that $2,000 lease payment, some electricity for the fence, some electricity to pump the water. Like that's it, you know, uh, that at that point in time, you know, like our cow calfer is going to be to the point that it's, it's, it's going to be getting pretty big. It's mostly going to be bought and paid for once you have all this infrastructure in place and your, your cow calf herd is bought and paid for while it takes a long time to get there. You literally start looking at a business model. That's like easily, easily like 80, 85 cent profit because of all the investments you've made up front. And, uh, you know, to me, that's really desirable. Beyond the economics of it, like I'm totally sold out, totally believe in the mission of planting grass and, and getting rid of as many row crop fields as we possibly can. I, I think the very existence of this country depends on that. And I'm, I'm not trying to sound... Uh, you know, scary or anything. Like I just believe that's the factual case. We've got to convert burned out row crop ground into perennial pastures and raise ruminants if we want to survive. How much do you think you can affect the carrying capacity by choosing the right perennial native species for your location? Do you think there's a big difference there? Like, could you go on seedcompany.com and pick out the best lineup possible plant that in your field get that established and that will make your grazing so much better than if you did a just random willy-nilly approach i've seen documentation from universities and this this has been a few years ago at a conference don't ask me to send it to you i don't have it right off the top of my head but they showed anywhere from a, a 40 to a 150% increase in biomass per acre by planting the right selected varieties of plants, not only for your region, but for, but, but for your livestock. Like if you're doing sheep or cattle or whatever, like you can literally double raising capacity of ground Based on these university studies, by, by choosing, you know, XYZ seeds over ABC seeds, um, I want a good stand of high-quality stuff from the get-go. I want to know exactly what I'm going to get. I understand not wanting to spend money on seeds, but honestly, when you look at all these numbers, like the perennial seeds, let's take the, the perennials out of it. The perennial, the, the perennial seeds are 2500 bucks. Out of thirty thousand dollars, like that's just not that much money to know that you're going to have a great sand of high quality plants and forage out there, which is what it's all about at the end of the day, versus hoping that the right stuff is going to magically show up. I, I get it, I understand it. I think if if you know planting the right seed was ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars, then you have a much stronger case for saying, hey, let's do bale grazing and get free seeds out there and or let's just like let go and see what comes up there's stuff in the seed bank that's all true that's all true but when you say that you're making the assumption that like all clovers are created equal and they aren't like there are improved varieties of clovers that seed companies have developed and i'm not talking genetically modified i'm just saying like they've selected it's like selecting the best tomato right well, I want the best grazing type of red clover that's highly digestible with lots of protein that will do well in central Indiana as I can possibly get my hands on. And if that means I have to spend 150 bucks an acre to get it, count me in. Because to me, like that just makes sense from a business standpoint. 
I know that seed's going to pay for itself. You know, this is definitely an evolution. Uh, and this, like, there's definitely, uh, at some point in the near future, will be another follow up podcast on this as we continue to learn and, um, you know, figure this thing out. Like, I'm, I'm kind of learning as I go here and I, I'm, I'm sharing those experiences. And, uh, this, you know, particularly when we're, we're talking about like, uh, you know, the online, uh, content. There, there's a module in the course that's going to continue to grow over time. It's all about pasture innovation, but uh, this is this is something we'll circle back to in the future as we we get further into it. There you have it, part two of converting a row crop field over to pasture. Stay tuned for future episodes on this subject because it's something we'll circle back to in 2019. If you want to learn more about this subject, look back through the podcast archives, because there have been a few episodes we've done in the past that relate very closely to today's episode. And I've also had a couple of guests on that talk about material similar to what we talked about today. So you can do that right here in the podcast feed on iTunes or at grassfedlife.co slash podcast. And one thing that you should be doing this year, if you haven't already done so, is have a meeting with your CPA, your accountant, now, prior to the end of the year, prior to doing something last minute. Meet with them and say, where am I at tax-wise? How profitable have I been? How much have I potentially lost? Could a tax write-off help me? This is really important information to know and to think about. Because if you can purchase something, whether that's an expense like buying a course that we offer or buying a piece of equipment that you can write off via Section 179 election, you want to know what your options are and how those options can affect your tax burden. Talk to your CPA and find out where you stand and if a write-off could help you. Maybe it's a piece of equipment. Maybe it's some education. Maybe it's something else. Don't leave money on the table, go into the end of the year informed, and set up that meeting now. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Next week, I'll be back with another episode of Grass-Fed Life. Until then, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.